Welcome to Artwork. Tonight we are extremely honored to have Nick Hallett, an artist that I've known for over 10 years in a variety of contexts. Uh, Nick Hallett is an artist that wears a lot of hats, um, at least three of those hats I'm familiar with, and I think he's going to tell you about a few more of them, maybe. Uh, one of the most uh, interdisciplinary artists I know, which is why I think he's really it's really great that he's coming to talk at Lang. Um, interdisciplinary, not just in terms of the mediums he employs uh, or even the genres within which he works, but also the roles that he plays in the cultural landscape of New York City. He's uh, an artist, he's a composer, he's a singer, vocalist, uh, also a cultural producer, producer, organizer, I would go as far as to say, uh, at moments, an empresario. Uh, he really is one of the um, most frequent collaborators I see, working with many of my peers and many of the people that I know in New York City, working in many, many disciplines. Uh, the people you've collaborated with over the years are enormous, I, just an enormous list that I, I wouldn't even begin to try to enumerate, uh, and again, in many, 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 many disciplines. So I am now going to uh, give, give you a sense of just a couple of projects as I understand them. Of course, Nick's going to talk about his work, so I just want to give you a little, a little sense. Um, so Nick is a, he's a composer, a vocalist, a cultural producer, as I said. His, his projects explore the possibilities of the voice as instrument across multiple musical genres including contemporary classical, electronica, and a range of popular styles, often in combination. He writes songs and music for multiple voices, which he integrates into operas and other cross-disciplinary forms. Nick often collaborates with artists in dance, performance, cinema, and new media. He also very often performs in his own works. His music has been presented in New York at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, Ecstatic Music Festival, the Haydn Planetarium, the Public Theater, Town Hall, Performa, The Kitchen, Issue Project Room, Roulette, National Sawdust, Le Poisson Rouge, uh, basically everywhere that, that matters, uh, and many other places as well. And internationally, his music has appeared at Transmedial in, in Berlin, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Mutec, Mexico City and the Singapore International Festival of the Arts, among others. Uh, as well as a composer and, and a musician, he is one of the most interesting curators and organizers of events that I, that I know of. One of the projects that he's done over the years is called the Darmstadt series, which he co-founded with Zach Layton, who of course I, I, a lot of you know, he, uh, he taught here for the last three years, I believe, in, in the music department. Um, the Darmstadt series was conceived as a, originally conceived as a casual listening event of avant-garde recordings, and then quickly became uh, an organization that hosted modern classical music concerts and nightclubs, and within a few years had evolved into a presenter of festivals and large-scale performances of repertory from the experimental music canon. Uh, in 2014, Darmstadt, for Darm you're going to talk about Originale? Okay, I'm going to say, yeah, cut me off whenever you want, because you should talk about your work, but I do want to give a sense from, from my perspective. I will say that Originale was one of the most amazing uh, happenings that I've, I've certainly seen, and I think it, I, I think it definitely uh, integrated the New York arts world in a way that exceeded Stockhausen's original attempt in, in 1964. Uh, so, Another project that I, that I heard myself at the New Museum, which I really loved, was called Whispering Pines, uh, co-authored with Shauna Moulton. Are you going to talk about this one, too? Okay, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, it premiered at the Kitchen in 2010. Uh, the opera is an innovative performance hybrid that incorporates elements of traditional opera uh, into contemporary video and performance art. The original music and libretto composed by Nick, uses a dream logic to weave what is essentially a pop music vocabulary into an experimental idiom, enabling a virtuosic exploration of the voice. 
uh, this particular piece has been around. Uh, it subsequently was staged at uh, SF MoMA, Carolina Performing Arts, Portland Institute of Contemporary Arts, Time-Based Arts Festival, uh, Krikoteca in Krakow, the Warhol Museum, among others. Uh, Nick's currently working on his second opera entitled to music, which I hope you'll talk about a little bit. In, in recent years, Nick has been especially involved with the dance world. Uh, in 2014, he began a collaboration with the choreographer and director Bill T. Jones as the composer of a trilogy of scores uh, for the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company. Um, they are Dora Tramontaine, 2015, Lance, a.k.a. Pretty, a.k.a. The Escape Artist, 2016, and Ambrose, The Emigrant, 2017. Uh, Nick has toured with the company as a vocalist and multi-instrumentalist in the performances of the uh, Analogy Trilogy and an additional work featuring his music, A Letter to My Nephew. Uh, Nick's scores for dance also include the Bessie Award, winning variations on themes from Lost and Found, Scenes from a Life and Other Works by John Berndt, directed by Ishmael Houston-Jones and Miguel Gutierrez, based on original choreography and music by John Berndt. Uh, so I could go on, but I think really it's Nick's turn to, to talk about his work. Uh, I want to remind everyone to stick around for a question and answer afterwards, because that's a very important part of what we do here. And without further ado, I introduce to you Nick Hallett. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for that uh, introduction. I'm going to be talking about a lot of, of these projects um, that, that um, Joe mentioned to you. Uh, but I wanted to give you just a little bit of background um, into how I got to become so interested in inter interdisciplinary work and where it, what it all comes from because um, Joe mentioned that I'm a, a singer. And everything um, that I deal with starts and ends with my voice. And um, I wanted to kind of bring you into that world by showing you some things. Now I wanted to just point out that this, that this talk is about the voice as something that is both um, inside the body and outside of the body, or dis disembodied, this, you know, this kind of Cartesian um, duality between the mind and body and, and the, um, uh, the, the disembodied voice and the embodied voice. So that we will see images of the body. These will be explicit um, images. So I just wanted to say if you are squeamish at all or if you don't want to see images of the body, please avert your eyes or please um, leave the room. Um, because uh, uh, as a youth, I um, had a very diverse arts education. And um, I was uh, discovering my identity at the time, and this happened to me. Your name, please. Nicholas Hallett. And was that ready? And today's date? August 30th, 1991. Count from one to ten, please. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And count by scale down from where you were. So you're going one, two, three, four. Slow. One, two, three, four. Go back to three. Three. One, three. One, one, two, three. Three. Hold that. Three. Say he, 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 he. Keep it going. He, 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 he. Sing a five note scale, please. Um. On ah. Ah. Uh, and higher. Ah. Uh, and relax the tongue based tension on that last one. Ah. Uh, Support. Uh, A little better. Ah. Again, a little of anything the, uh, the vagabond will do. Give to me the life I love, let the lave go by me. Give the jolly heaven above, and the byway nigh me. Fine. 
take a deep breath and say, straight tone. I'll keep it going. Stop motion recording. Same pitch. Straight tone. Yep. Pitch, please. Crescendo. And lower still piano. Crescendo. So there it was. I had seen my voice. Um, and, you know, this is, I had literally just turned uh, 17 years old at this point. Um, and I uh, knew at that point that whatever it is that I had seen, I wanted to know more about it. Uh, not just from a scientific level, but from uh, a level of how it could help me explore my identity. I'm, um, uh, I'm 16 years, 17 years old at this point. My, my um, queer identity is burgeoning at this point. Um, it's also uh, 1991, and uh, anyone born after 1991 um, uh, know what was happening to queer men burgeoning identities or not in 1991? What were they doing? They were dying, exactly. So this is part of who I, um, who, this is part of who was emerging. You didn't, you were born before 1991, so you cheated. Um, but, <laughs> so, um, Anyway, this is this is the the time of this is the time in which I came of age and, and the time of which my voice was maturing. Um, so anyway, uh, this uh, tape happened at a uh, a prominent otolaryngologist's office, um, and I learned that I had the opportunity um, to apply to Oberlin Conservatory and study with a real master of vocal pedagogy, uh, name whose name was Richard Miller. Um, I had this, you know, kind of insignificant choral voice, not really like an opera singer's voice, but I knew that I wanted to work with him and, I, and he had this acoustics lab and I was determined to learn more about the, uh, uh, about the voice uh, from this perspective. So I begged him, eventually there was a cancellation in his studio, I was able to become part of his studio and I was his studio assistant for uh, five years uh, studying uh, voice and voice performance, but also studying linguistics at that time. And I was very specifically interested in phonetics and phonology and language change through the body, which is how we, uh, how human language develops. Um, and then I graduated and I decided to become an artist. I didn't know what being an artist meant at the time. I knew I wanted to come to New York. I knew I wanted to work with other great artists, but I didn't necessarily know um, what I was going to sing or what my voice was yet at that point. Um, and I want to kind of just like rush you through some of the, the, um, the bio that gets you to um, the stuff that uh, uh, Joe was talking about, but I essentially came here uh, expecting to uh, explore the the avant-garde. This was my my interest. Uh, I had developed a, a fascination with um, you know composers like John Cage, ones who were a a aligned with the the new school um, and its rich history. And um, but something happened when I came to New York is that I just started writing songs. Something about the energy of this city um, gave that to me, and I started writing songs and I started writing lyrics too. Um, and I um, formed a band in order to kind of have a vehicle for these songs. But um, you know, I had always I said a diverse arts ed arts education. So here I was trying to find the vehicle for the for the songs, and then there was a performance art element, and I had to have an alter ego, and we needed to have video projection, and suddenly the Piece, suddenly this becomes something more than just a band, it becomes an art project. And um, the project tended to thrive a little bit more in art circles than in music circles. And eventually that project, like most bands that you'll be in after you graduate from college, it went away and I had to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, but I had put all of my energy into this band and I literally had lost my voice. I had no idea how to sing anymore outside of the context of this project. Um, and I um, tried lots of things. I tried to 
figure out how to have a voice beyond the singing voice, beyond the com compositional voice. I also, at this time, I wasn't ever, I wasn't calling myself a composer. Um, I, you know, I had, I didn't have any formal composition training, and I wasn't aspiring to be that at that time. Um, but I knew I wanted to make things like operas. I knew I wanted to make performances. I knew I wanted to do these things. Um, and eventually I turned to the art world and I turned to the art world as a place um, of real research and exploration and a place where I could really start to think about this kind of relationship um, uh, of how to connect the science and the vocal pedagogy that I had acquired through working with this preeminent vocal um, pedagogue and how to turn it into art, um, you would say. Um, and I started to try to, uh, I started to come up with um, ways in which I could think about how voice pedagogy, and when we talk about voice pedagogy and we're talking about, you know, imaging the larynx, we're looking at, uh, we're thinking about the history of, the history of voice science and how Manuel Garcia, how he invented the flexible mirror in the um, early uh, 18th century, uh, don't quote me on that date specifically, um, and was able to identify uh, this, uh, identify the, the biofeedback mechanism of sight and the voice, you seeing the voice. And this happens at the same time as the bel canto techniques of, uh, of, um, of bigger orchestras and the kinds of um, architectural spaces in which these uh, uh, voices are singing. And, you know, we're basically getting into the, the beginning of of modern technological opera, uh, you know, opera as a, a spectacle, opera involving mechanics, opera involving architecture. And how can we think about these exercises that um, are so intuitive to the voice as a tool for creation? Um, and furthermore, this kind of intuition that we have as a singer, um, what kinds of things do we sing? And what are those gestures? What are the are the formations of the larynx um, that that uh, ha that relate to the mental patterns and the grammars of music that we understand? And I I kind of took it to especially in light of what I what New York was giving me is that it, it all came down to songs. So I started um, trying to think about how we can extend the idea of the art song. Now the art song being something that I was singing here in this video at 16 years old, something that really allowed me to. Um, to explore my own identity in the art song, you have like you know you have Schubert's you have a Schubert song uh, Gretchen am Spinnrad, Gretchen at her spinning wheel. This is a Faust story, and Gretchen uh, is singing about her love for Faust. Um, but the singer um, isn't wearing a costume. The singer doesn't have to be the gender of the character that's singing in the poem. In fact, we, art songs are normally decontextualized from the characters that are singing them. They're, they really are a union of pure text and music, kind of bypassing um, theater or drama. And that was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to think, think about the idea of the art song and how we could expand that and who also had been expanding it already, artists like Meredith Monk and Laurie Anderson, and the ways in which we could really, really um, expand the definition of a song. So I set off at that point to try to figure out how to create a practice that would engage those to uh, engage all of these concepts of voice, um, uh, you know, especially in light of what I'm talking about before my burgeoning queer identity, this art song, this place for me to explore all of these different ways in which a voice can express, um, express the full spectrum of, of gender, of sound, of, um, of conscious, of really of human consciousness. And um, so let me now, I'm going to go a little non-linear here, uh, but I, let me show you a project and the inspiration for a project um, that kind of gets into maybe one way in which I deal with this. So why don't, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, this text first. Um, there is a text that I am, that I was made aware of during my time as a linguistics major and as a voice pedagogy enthusiast, uh, that is a diagnostic text. It's one that's used by speech pathologists. It's used by diction coaches, dialect coaches, um, and it's uh, meant to, um, 
it's meant to qualify different aspects of, of the voice uh, in terms of the, the fields that I'm mentioning. And this one was particularly interesting to me. Uh, it was called, it uh, has every single sound of the English language and it's called The Rainbow Passage. And here was a video that I had um, seen that um, kind of inspired music in me. All right, this is Rachel. She's back with us again, and she's going to do her before and after. She rarely has to use the before voice, um, but she's going to give us a sample in a little minute. So the first thing, Rachel, if you wouldn't mind, just tell me oh, well, whether it's a TV show that you'd like or um, a movie you've seen or a book that you're reading, just about a minute of your voice right now is in your feminine range. Um, well, <laughs> well, I just saw the la that new X-Men Wolverine movie. Um, it was a really good movie. I liked it. Um, there's a lot of hot guys in there, so anybody who wants to see it, definitely check it out. Um, it was a really good movie. I liked it a lot. The ending kind of was unexpected, but oh well. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, yeah, being dragged on, but it was still a very good movie. Okay, and just to give the, the listening audience some feedback about that, you were at G3 or G uh, A3, which is 196 to 220, so that's perfect. And if you would read that um, rainbow passage, you can hold it, pick it up so that it's comfortable to look at, whatever you'd like to do. Okay, um, when the sunlight strikes, strikes rain drops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long, round arch. With its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon, there is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. When a man looks for something beho beyond his reach, his friends say he is looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Good, very nice. And so tell me about that same movie, see if you can uh, adjust down into your before voice, and tell me about the movie again. Um, the movie was really good. I, from my point of view, I mean, not following the other movies so much, I liked it, seeing where Wolverine came from, because I have some friends who like it, who like, who've seen all three and then read the comics and then know the storyline, so I kind of get from their feedback that, oh, they messed this up or they messed this up, and it just, yeah, it was... Okay, so feedback, your pitch was about 131 hertz or C3 on the keyboard. So in the best, uh, I know it's hard to keep your voice down there. Um, go ahead and read that paragraph again if you would, please, Rachel. Um, when the light strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The, rain, uh, the rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arch. With its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon, there is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. When a man looks for something behind, beyond his reach, his friends say he is looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Okay, so switch back up to Rachel and just tell me three things you're going to do with your day today. Um, today I'm actually going to go to work. Um, work until 9 o'clock, get off, go home, study for my final exam that's going to that's going to be next Monday, and go to sleep. <laughs> and so some feedback. So your reading pitch was at the B3 or the C3, which is 123 to 131, and then you immediately got right back to the G sharp, which is 208 hertz. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Nicely done. Okay, I'll, I'll move into the work sample pretty fast, but I just want to say here was you know something fascinating to me right, in so that... Um, go away. Okay. Um, you know, here we're using pitch and musical uh, technique to help people transition into the genders that they uh, want to be. And that is something that is very powerful uh, of a way in which voice pedagogy and voice science can help people um, identify who they are and help them identify their voice and bring voice to other uh, resonances in their, in their person. Um, and that was something that was very inspiring to me just beyond sound and physics. Um, and so I wanted to uh, create a, a piece that was a setting of this rainbow passage, uh, one that looked at the text, um, also it's about rainbows too, um, <laughs> uh, that looked at, looked at it from this phonetic standpoint, but also uses it as a way of kind of telling a kind of, uh, creating kind of a, like a, a vocal program music. So we use the language, but we also uh, stretch the language. We cut up the vowel sounds, we cut up the consonants. Um, we, put the, we put digital effects on them and uh, we put them through echo, this kind of biofeedback element of um, how we, uh, 
how we listen to ourselves and that kind of um, the, the, uh, the internal vibrations of how we experience sound in our body and how we can mimic that through electronics. Um, so let me play you a little bit of that. There are, um, you'll also see one element here. Also, just so you know, I'm not going to play you any music that doesn't have something to look at or th has some context to, um, to share it within. So this piece has um, uh, light art uh, that's by my partner, Brock Monroe. Um, you'll see here, it's not video, it's pure light. It also, it, it is allowed to explore the same kind of chromaticism that, and the same kind of resonance um, that, the, that the music is operating on. Uh, I'm performing here and this is Daisy Press and um, Megan Schubert here. to edit these ones. Um, so um, here's, uh, here's something I wrote down. The search for the voice that extends beyond the body. What kind of music does it make? Um, and you'll start to you'll start to hear this here in terms of song, um, but I'm very interested in you know you know here we had we had language abstracted just to the point where you understand what it is, but we're hearing it as something more, and what it is is connected to these ideas of of um, what it means to be a classical singer. A lot of, I would say that I'm not necessarily a. a, a 
I probably am not a classical composer, but I'm most interested in working with classical voices and trained voices because I'm interested in the kinds of sounds that um, that they make. And also, we're t you know we're talking. You're seeing where I'm coming from in terms of my training, my interest in bel canto, and um, those that ancient knowledge, if you will, of 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 that technic technical uh, point. Um, so here we are trying to stretch the stretch the songs out. Literally, we're trying to get the singers to sing the length, a note that is the length of one of uh, of a breath cycle. And this is something you're, I'm going to show you um, in a few different um, uh, other uh, pieces as well. Um, so uh, let me start to talk about the ways in which this kind of musical writing is become useful in the kinds of culture that I'm interested in creating. Because um, uh, it's actually difficult for me to talk about how I work as a composer just writing music, because everything that inspires music tends to happen outside of it. And uh, the way I like to work or the way I've ended up working is somewhat as a kind of a project generator and a cultural producer. I call myself a cultural producer over calling myself an artist because I tend not to, I, I tend to make the music, but I tend to be involved in the structuring of the project. And I like to think of using music as a kind of musical, as a kind of a dramatur dramaturgy, dramatur dramaturgy. Um, and so, um, what, where does something like this go? How does this tell a story? Um, or how does it tell us, and how does it tell a story without using language in a traditional way? So, um, I uh, really, really, during this period of time where I was telling you that I had, had lost my voice and I was looking, uh, looking to find it again, I really discovered uh, a, a rich uh, area of research in the contemporary art world. And um, this is how I started to work with light artists and um, artists in new media and artists working in video. And uh, eventually I came across a, uh, a video series called Whispering Pines, and its artist is uh, Shauna Moulton, and I had, hadn't seen anything that had inspired me so much in years. And I became her huge, huge fan, and I offered, I offered, I approached her with adapting her video series into an opera. Uh, and we worked together, and we, we created this, this piece in the art world um, at a time when opera was a, a very unfashionable word. Um, and we created this stage piece that uh, Joe described. And it's, it seems to have had something of a, of a life. Um, we continued to, we, we performed it, we toured it for about five years. Um, and we are about to uh, release it as a new on a new platform, which is the internet. So we've um, I, and I want to you want you to be the first to see some of this uh, material. So um, this is a another way in which I like to. I'll just talk about it on musical terms first, and then you'll you'll kind of see the premise of the of the piece, and you'll see Shauna, um, and you'll hear Daisy again. Um, but one other way in which I like to think about expanding the um, the definition of an art song is through uh, wordplay and glossolalia, and something I like to call vowel harmony. Um, and so this is a piece that is a play on the word eno. And there are lots of ways in which we can in interpret that. Let's see. So, Let's see. Um, I want to. Joe asked if I would talk a little bit about my uh, new opera. Um, this is a piece that's developing, uh, and this one gets a little bit more into the nature—not just the nature of voice, but the nature of music. Where does it come from? Um, and I'm telling the story uh, with a somewhat of a of an air of cynicism here, maybe, um, and. Uh, why don't I show you a little bit about it? This is a, a clip. The, just so you get the context, is the 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 opera is um, 
it's a series of um, private moments. And what happens in these private moments uh, is, oh, think about yourself when you're alone and in the bathroom. You're not talking, but you might make a sound, right? You might make a, a sound that's non-linguistic. Um, and that sound that you make is it very much connected to your thought process. And here you are uh, making, this, making these sounds in these private moments. I'm trying to work with that sense of the voice in this piece. So the, the piece is ultimately a, a, a weaving of private moments. And they happen simultaneously so that we can get people who are in different places singing together, so we can get voices together, bodies apart. Um, and you'll see, uh, I guess I didn't show you a, a clip of the live performance of, um, of Whispering Pines, but you'll see that um, I'm very much into the, as, as a performance act, I'm, I'm very much into the, um, very much into the uh, the idea of singing as this ultimate performance act. So I tend not to I tend to try to bypass a lot of uh, theatrical expression, theatrical convention, and how I like to bring um, different media together so that we can kind of be brought into a psychology that takes us out of of traditional storytelling tropes in order to get us into that psychology, to get us into that private moment where we might be making a sound that means something that's connected to our emotions but isn't necessarily a word. So, um, uh, and one of the great things um, and great contexts for that in this day and age is the internet. So um, this piece is very much about the internet. The, the setting for the, um, the opera is the composer, uh, the artist, in their studio, working, and how they get distracted from making work. Uh, and in this moment, I'm just going to play a, 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 a little excerpt here. The, the distraction for the composer is uh, a online admirer. And so this might be, a, this is a way in which I would deal with my interest in connecting non-language singing to telling a story.
Okay, so um, let's see. So you, one of the things that I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to integrate uh, strategies for making video and making art into the composition of the music. Those two things are, are inextricable from each other. I need to create my libretto um, and have some sense of the video design before I even put the music onto the page. And um, this is an interesting way of working. Uh, and this is, tends to be why for my projects I tend to write my own librettos. Luckily I had some experience as a songwriter, this is kind of, and, and as, I, as I said, I'm trying to keep everything in the realm of song, including the, this opera work. I'm not interested in operatic music. I'm trying to bring in other kinds of music into what we think of as opera. Um, but I'm interested in working with opera singers. Um, these ones are uh, Mimi Watkins and Peter Alex Stewart. Uh, and the video here is designed by Josh uh, Thorson. So um, you, uh, I'm talking a lot about my collaborators because I work almost exclusively in uh, collaboration. And um, so uh, with something like the Shauna Moulton piece, um, I approached her about adapting her her premise to the stage and into this operatic world. And what was great about that um, experience was that um, uh, I just wrote the whole opera. I wrote all the music and all the words first, and then she just made a piece to it. So we actually had this very, very um, disjointed creative process in which we kind of each made our own piece, and then we kind of came together and tried to tried to make it uh, make something out of it. But it's the furthest thing from indeterminate. I mean, we. <laughs> uh, but really, what you're seeing is two separate pieces and two artists that are interested in combining. Um, uh, their respective fields into something that's um, beyond what either of them could do by themselves. Um, and that's something that I, I like. I like. I like that as a, as a um, model for collaboration. Um, just because I know, w w how much time do we have left? Oh, 30 minutes. Okay, so I have plenty of time to show things. Okay, great. I'm trying to rush through things. Right, but we want to leave time for two, including, okay, so let me, I want to, let me, I'll show one of these things because I think this is important because I want to talk about collaboration just because I want to get you to the work I'm doing now because the, um, uh, the, the past few years um, have been taken up by this really ex very extraordinary experience. I've been, I've worked very intimately with the choreographer Bill T. Jones on a trilogy of scores and then some. And, um, you know, uh, this is where um, I've started to be, uh, m my work is, um, is being accepted into these incredibly diverse uh, communities. And I'm able to uh, work with artists um, that are so different um, than, than me and who give me um, so much insight into my own uh, experience. I'm not, and I'm not just talking about the artists, but I'm also talking about the, the, um, the uh, Bill's approach and the, the specific tasks and the specific realms in which I'm having to create sound and having to create music and help create a music dramatic structure for a, for a, a dance theater piece. Uh, but I wanted to play you something through an anecdote um, and this is uh, this is not a an easy one, but um, it's a good uh, example of how my uh, kind of musical vocabulary kind of ties to this uh, sense of exploring one's voice and bringing voice to um, to identity. Um, but uh, the second piece in our trilogy, which apparently many of you or some of you have seen, is based on an oral history that Bill conducted with his nephew, who at the, at the time we commenced the piece, uh, the nephew's name is Lance, uh, was, um, he was paraplegic, uh, HIV positive, and um, uh, had other uh, unexplainable health issues and was going into countless surgeries. Um, Bill was trying to get him to make a show about his life and trying to uh, um, also simultaneously take this oral history and turn it into a piece of his for his company. Um, and at some point in the uh, process, Bill is having these 
interviews with Lance. Um, and at some point, Lance is about to go uh, under uh, general anesthesia for a very, very risky surgery. Bill is trying, uh, uh, and, and the doctors are telling him he might not come out of the surgery alive. Um, Bill writes an email and says, Nick, um, we, I finally got Lance to write this song. You'll, and you'll hear what, uh, what his songs are. He's, he's singing them from his, uh, from his bed. Um, and uh, this is just audio I'm going to play. Uh, here is a situation where I have this, um, these, ex these, you know, I, I try to stay away from what I call extended vocal techniques. I'm more interested in trying to attain a, pure, a kind of a pure vocalism. Again, this is connecting to my interest in the disembodied, the disembodied voice. But I'm here. I have this disembodied chorale of uh, of um, of ululatory sounds, creating this bed that is a essentially a. Um, like a Baroque gospel uh, anthem for this uh, person who is just unapologetic about his life and whose the stakes couldn't be higher for him at the moment that he's creating, uh, creating this song, creating this text. And how do you serve that with the music and with this creative process? Um, it's been a, a remarkable um, uh, uh, experience for me how to work in collaboration in, in, in that way. Uh, it's definitely affected how I how I see making of my own work and um, kind of what what the usefulness is of the kind of the, the kind of uh, music that I'm interested in making. I'm very interested in what what the use of any kind of art or music is. What kind of culture does it make? That's more or less what I'm interested in. I think I talked about that before in terms of uh, cultural production. So um, why don't we move actually a little bit into cultural production because um, because the the cultural production is a way in which I've been able to expand my voice outside of my voice box and think about what it means to have a proverbial voice, which is, of course, um, we're still connected to that um, even in the in the creative work. But I've always been, managed to find projects uh, where I still have space for my own music and my own voice um, as a performer, as a composer with, within them. And um, the Darmstadt series, I, I just want to show this, um, this one project that uh, um, Joe was, oh, uh, um, we're a second away, or two away um, uh, from showing it. Um, but um, uh, so uh, the the Darmstadt series, we, we began in uh, 2004, Zach Layton and I, and people have taken Zach's courses, people remember him, the undergrads here. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, so Zach, um, and I, uh, with our Darmstadt series, we, pr we started presenting these, these canonic experimental works that institutions really weren't programming, and we started doing them in bars and clubs. And eventually our piece picked up, all the, our series picked up traction, and we started doing more elaborate festivals and working with uh, really f phenomenal, th really the greats, um, the people who inspired us um, as composers. Actually, what's funny is that one of the reasons why I even started composing in the first place is because we started getting all these like New York Times reviews for uh, our Darmstadt programming and the New York Times would call me a composer and I, and I was like, okay, well, I guess I better start composing, starting, you know, if the New York Times is calling me this and I don't even call this myself. So anyway, so um, <laughs> for our 10th, uh, anniversary, um, this is one of the things that I kind of set out to do with the series, um, which was um, was to work with this piece, this uh, this Stockhausen piece. He came, Stockhausen uh, came to New York in 1964 uh, with a piece that he had written a few years earlier called The Originale. And this was his uh, response to Fluxus. And um, he, uh, you know, he was a bit of an outre character in New York even in the 60s and maybe people know the history already but um, he he um, the artists Tony Conrad Henry Flint were protesting his um, his work here uh, he had made some disparaging remarks about jazz apparently uh, and uh, they uh, anyway Stockhausen, you know, and maybe people know this, one of the reasons why Stockhausen's work uh, wasn't really being approached after 9-11 is he see, because he said 9-11 was the greatest work of art ever achieved. And so this is a, this is a, contrary, uh, a contrary controversial uh, figure, and you can, see, you can see why his work doesn't get um, programmed much. Um, but, I, but that didn't stop me and Zach from wanting to present his work. And, we, uh, and um, this piece, Originale, in 1964 came here because Charlotte Moorman, uh, the cellist, uh, and 
and uh, also Im impresario uh, wanted to bring it here and she wanted to um, cast it with uh, the artists that she thought were um, were the most original artists uh, working in the time and she uh, she brought in Alvin Lucier and David Berman a lot of people again connected to the new school's um, lineage uh, Allen Ginsberg uh, Io uh, um, uh, Alan Caprow, uh, you know, these, uh, George McCunis. So uh, in doing so, he uh, uh, there was actually like a big sp splinter group of Fluxus that came and protested, and it was this very, very controversial event, the 64 uh, production of the Originale. So in uh, 2014, when we were turning 10, I wanted to do this version, and I wanted to think about how, what it means to make a 21st century Originale. And I wanted to inscribe this this Stockhausen piece with a with the idea of a, a queer utopia, so um, so why don't I just show you a little bit of little bit of it? But it's a it's a really remarkable piece, and it just requires um, it requires the artists to be themselves to Stockhausen's clock. So. Stockhausen sets, there, there's, a, there's a specific cast, you're given your time marks, and then in, within those time marks, you, do, you are yourself, you do what you want to do. Um, and then the only people who are following a score are these musicians, and they are trying to play a piece of Stockhausen's, an electronic, electroacoustic piece of his called Contacte, which is one of the composers best known. So um, uh, in, in effect, what happens is the, the, the piece is, it's a theater piece where, th where the musicians are trying to play Contacte, and they keep getting interrupted by all these performance artists. So uh, I'll kind of show you what we're what we're looking at um, okay so here this is uh, something that's very interesting to me um, in terms of what what my voice is capable of doing is as, as, a, as a community builder as ways in bringing artists together creating space for myself to make art within it um, is something that is uh, really important to me and then putting that out as culture and seeing putting it in front of an audience putting it in front of people um, that being something that is connected to music but connected to art connected to performance connected to dance um, what is the use usefulness of this sound, this music that I'm making the, the, that comes from my body. Uh, how does, how many, how many ways in which, uh, how many ways can I use my voice and um, in, to make art, to make music, to make culture? Um, this is something that I, I deal with. What, um, what, is th what is that voice and what does it sing? What does it make? Um, do I have time for one more project before we do questions, or should we do? Should we do? Let's do questions. Okay. I have. There's many more projects. I, wa I wanted to get a little bit more into my work with light art and kinesis and how that le leads to dance. And so w why don't we leave it at there? Leave it at that. Um, you know, I kind of tried to show you a little bit about um, my my creative projects, my music, and then how that leads into these other kinds of curat curat curatorial projects, which give me space to also create within them, but also allow me to work with many artists and create communities. So it all kind of, um, it, to me, it all comes back to, to my voice and, um, and, and how my body is capable of, of, uh, of um, producing these things. So maybe that's a narcissistic way of thinking about it, but singing is the, is the ultimate act of self-love. This is what I tell my voice students. The vibrations that we feel when we sing, they, they heal us, they, they, they support us, they, um, they're good for our health. So keep singing and you'll kn you don't know what's gonna come out of you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm curious why, why you think that um, over the last several years, so many uh, so many artists have gone into the areas of um, experimental uh, like music, theater, and opera. It seems like it's one of the major trends in theater in uh, performance now. Um, well, hmm, I might need some help with that uh, uh, question. Someone, and your Sorry. Joe can probably uh, help me with that. I don't know. It's 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 so interesting to me. Um, you know, when I when Shauna and I made the Whispering Pines, there was no prototype festival. There was no. Um, there wasn't really a platform for new opera in New York City. You had like the City Opera has this like Vox festival. Um, and one of the reasons why I had a hard time thinking about myself as a composer was because I had no means to th even figure out how I was going to stage something 
on that level and in that context. And I really looked to the art world at that time as a place where there was more possibility. And um, I don't know, I've seen more and more artists create works that they are calling opera, whether they have classical singers or orchestras or chamber pieces, chamber ensembles doing the music. Um, that, that word became uh, more fashionable. Um, similarly, uh, I think we've see, we've seen, and we this keep this is a conversation we keep hearing about how the opera audience is getting older. They're not, they're not they're dying, and we need to figure out how we can create opera for new generations. That's coupled with the fact that there are just other people who are thinking like me and thinking like uh, Joe, who are just um, who are just trying to create new work uh, that involves the voice. A lot of opera doesn't involve the voice. I, my opera involves the voice. Um, uh, and just how to redefine the, redefine, the, redefine the term, really, and how to find new audiences and create new contexts for, for what we want to call opera, what we want to think opera is. And actually, what's interesting is that um, a lot of what is being celebrated and recognized now is actually very, very traditional opera. I mean, uh, we, see, we still see operas with traditional librettos where the singer sings text. And what I like to say about these operas are that these are, these are um, places where people are kind of screaming at each other <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> um, and they and they and the, the librettos tend to be uh, without nuance when it comes to what it is a, a voice really wants to do. It's not really like a song lyric, which is designed to flow with a melody or flow with the voice. A composer normally gets a libretto from a from a librettist who isn't a singer and sets it to music in the opera composer doesn't really isn't really a singer either um, so we, we have we still have this opera that kind of um, it, it does it it takes voices for granted it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't respect voices in the same way so I'm trying to think about how we can make opera that um, that looks at the intuition of a, of a singer and kind of um, allows the singer to be the the creative force and or lets the voice sing for itself so um, I'm hoping that as we expand this definition we start to see more work like that because I feel like um, we want to start to um, move away from this kind of opera Syria. Uh, that's why I like to write these comic operas I th and like I put them in the forms of web series and uh, this new one, uh, the two music is a sitcom. It's a four 25 minute uh, scenes. So looking at formats outside of opera. So I, I think we're starting to see that happen. Hi. Um, Hi. I What's your name? Really, oh, sorry, my name is Zach. I'm Hi, a contemporary Zach. music major uh, here at the New School. Um, I found it was really interesting that you said that you come up with the visual elements of um, what you're producing before you actually write the music or the libretto. Um, I'm wondering if you could provide some more insight on your process and um, how that may have changed over time. Okay, well, I mean, I tend to, you know, with every everything, I didn't make anything you saw tonight. I work with a collaborator um, in, in, in that sense. Um, but the, but I, maybe I have these, maybe I have some delusions of grandeur here that I'm, that I do more than write the music in terms of how <laughs> we uh, create the process. But essentially, uh, the architecture of the music is reliant on the story being told through the imagery. So those, the process of coming, of, of writing the music has to be conceived with the art making strategy in order for the piece to come about. First of all, part of that ha has to do just with the fact that I'm lazy and I need the inspiration. I mean, I need I need something to tell. I I want a picture in front of me to write write a piece of music for. Um, I want uh, I need a story. I, I I'm I'm looking for something to pull the music out of me, and I t I tend to think that the culture is really that the culture that it's going to create is the thing that inspires me more than just making sound. I'm not interested in just making music. Otherwise, I would have just played you some some recordings. Um, I'm interested in what what it creates. Um, uh, for for an audience, so uh, in order, it, maybe I have to see it as the maybe I have to th think about myself as the audience. I have to put myself in different, um, you know, 
choose different experience, try to think about different phenomenologies I can enter in order to come up with that music. So sometimes I have to put myself in the place of the video designer. And um, one of the reasons why I've spent so much time working with new media and all these designers is so that I, I know what I'm doing. I know how they work and I know that their tools and I know what the limitations and the and the joys of the technology are and I can work with work with them to create something together where those two um, processes are integrated um, or not integrated in the case of the way I work with Shauna. Um, or what have I, uh, do I, what have I learned? Um, I just have learned that I need to keep continuing to learn because these tools are going to continue to change. We're going to have new technology and I want to be able to make pieces that, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, this, um, uh, both of the, I would say that both Whispering Pines and the opera that I'm developing are, are, are based on my fascination with a piece of software that is going to be the piece of software that's going to run the show. And how do you make, how would I use that software to make something that's, that, that speaks to me? What are you going to do next? Well, I'm, I'm really focusing on this opera, and this web series is coming out next month. So, uh, I mean, that's really what I'm focusing my energies on, are the new opera and the web series. So I'm really sharing with you tonight um, this new work. And, you know, no one has seen the, uh, what I just showed you. And one more thing. Um, do you know enough about software to create something that's unique to your type of art? Oh, so if I, I'm not going to generate my own software. I mean, if, um, uh, and I might not even be interested in that either. Um, I mean, if I came up with an artistic concept that I, that, I, that, I, that I needed to see realized and I just couldn't figure out a software platform to do it, I might work with a, a, a programmer, but I'm not, I don't have that skill set. I'm, I'm, my skill set is musical and I make the music and I'll work with, other creators, other collaborators to make a piece together. Um, but I'm, I'm myself, I'm not a programmer. And I tend to, I'll tend to, again, the same way that I want to make music for a voice that re respects the in intuition of the voice, I want, also want to create a piece of software or work with software that respects the intuition of the software. Uh, I'm not, in, I'm, I'm interested in that, um, that challenge, that um, that limitation, you know, the absence of limitations is the enemy of art, said Orson Welles. And I like that. I like to have I like to have deadlines. I like to have, you know, you can't do this, what are you gonna make instead? No. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's a defining factor or some type of through line in how you pick who you collaborate with. Um, well, what's interesting is in the past few years, people have chosen to collaborate with me, which is totally frightening, um, because uh, before that, I really self-generated my own projects. Um, and, and I have to say, too, that um, one of the reasons I was able to do that was through um, the trust of New York's uh, amazing cultural institutions. I've had an amazing relationship with The Kitchen for over a decade. Um, they've They've let me, uh, I've performed other people's work there. I've produced work for other artists there. I've premiered operas there. So most of what you saw tonight, uh, not most of what, but several of the projects you saw tonight um, kind of have some relation to the kitchen, also the New Museum of Contemporary Art. So uh, uh, a lot of it is context bound. Um, you know, normally it's not a person that brings me to their art, but what makes me want to collaborate with is who the person is. Uh, you know, I I dipped my toes in the in in the water with Shauna Moulton first. We hit it off. That's when I approached her about making a piece. We had uh, there were a f we we identified affinities with each other as people and as with our practices. So that it's really about who it's really about if we get along too. I mean, uh, with Joshua White, we did one show, and after that, I just it couldn't it couldn't be over. It had to keep going because we um, we became friends through one one experience. So friendship, obviously, clearly with Zach Layton, um, friendship really is a big factor in, in how collaboration works. Some, sometimes, and, and this is something um, I learned the, the hard way, sometimes you need to actually collaborate with people in order to stay friends with them because otherwise their lives are going to go off in some other direction and you'll lose them. <laughs> so so um, 
and I'm very, very, I'm, I'm very okay with thinking about a, uh, a social network as connected to an art making network. Those things are very, 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 very connected. Well, thank you so much for coming. It's been thank a you, Stefania. Round of yeah. Applause for Nicola, please.